Um, and so Diana, as many of you know, and I know some of you have read her book already, is the author of Waging Peace. Uh, it's a powerful, beautiful, and for me, it was quite an emotional story because I, I felt like I found myself in her story quite a bit. <laughs> um, so she's author of Waging Peace. She's a peacemaker, war veteran, sexual assault nurse, key relationships officer at Preemptive Love, and an activist, mama of two boys, um, anti-racist, recovering racist I saw on your screen as well. Um, I'm, I'm actually really honored that we get to be with you today on September 11th. You wrote a beautiful post on your Instagram today. So I'm going to hand over to you and we'll, we'll have a chat. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, thank you so much. And uh, maybe everyone cries when Edelet prays or <laughs> that's just me. Mm -hmm. um, but I did want to just honor honor this space and say that you dangerous women have been such an encouragement and I may have been kind of quiet this past year but knowing that there are brave women who are showing up for each other and who are speaking up and and who are holding hands as we do the work uh, inside and outside it's been um, such a safe space for me and there is Lisa and Sandy um, and Shaylee and Lisa, there's like, there's quite a few of you who have been really instrumental in saying yes, because I don't think anybody can go against the grain and ask for peace without having women standing behind her with their hand on my back saying yes, yes. Um, cause it's been a hard year. And I'm just going to say that Sender September 11th is a hard day for me, um, which feels extra like a God-given gift that I get to bring my whole self to this space and feel the lament and we'll get to the hope. Um, but I also, I know that September 11th is a, it's a cultural change. And I think too often our kids don't know what America was like before 9-11. And so they don't even know the goodness that um, being anti-Muslim wasn't really of value. It wasn't as big of a thing where post 9-11, um, they grew up in a whole culture that um, was very suspicious and demonizing of one group of our neighbors. Um, and so part of my hope is that we can bring back and breathe new life into our communities. Um, some that 9-11 has stolen from us and we're seeing the effects. Um, and for those of you who have read my book, 9-11 um, really is the impetus. It's, it's where my whole life um, went in a completely different direction. And I, I did post about it today um, where it just felt like a fault line. Like the day I was 23 years old, I had just finished my nurse's training. I would signed up to the military to go to college and I get this call on Valentine's Day, told me that I'm being deployed to the global war on terror, put my stuff in storage, break my lease, write a will, and they said, I can't tell you where you're going, and I cannot tell you when you'll be back. And I was 23 years old, like basically a college student plus. Um, so I just remember that day <clears throat> being like, catapulted into this before and after. And I knew that this phone call would change my life. Um, and I knew that I didn't want this future. I didn't even know what would happen to me. I could have been gone a week. At that point in time, the National Guard had never been deployed um, overseas since the Vietnam War. So it was 30 years, like it was not possible, but I knew something was going to change forever. And I didn't want that future but it was coming at me and I had to just walk into it. And so 9-11, I feel like is a really, um, it's a hallowed ground for me that I don't understand. There's a lot of lament, um, a lot of grief, a lot of loss. Um, and I don't quite ever know what to do with it, ever. It comes <laughs> and, um, but I did, I did get a message from uh, 
from a battle buddy who was deployed with me. And um, I haven't heard from her in, you know, 10 years. And she messaged me and this week. And she was like, Diana, I just read your prologue. And that was about convoying um, into enemy territory and being asked to um, run over a child if necessary. And she told me, she's like, just this Wednesday, I was driving down this dirt road with my 10 year old son and this squirrel was popping out as they do. She's like, but they always get away in time, right? She's like, but I went off the gas instinctively and she's like, but I heard a thunk. And she's like, in a minute, she's like, I hit it. I killed it. And she's like, and my son turned to look at me and he's like, mom, are you going to cry? And she's like, I already was. And she's like, Diana, it wasn't that I killed the squirrel. It's because it brought me back to that white knuckle driving where for months we were going across this border, not knowing if we would kill or be killed. Um, and so it, and she said it was healing for her to read read my story. She was like, it made me know that I'm normal for feeling these things and that I'm still the same person who experienced a year's worth of war, even though I'm a mom now, driving down a dirt road, experiencing something normal. So the beautiful thing is that as hard as this has been to share a story of peace and to even go back to the really painful places that I didn't I didn't want as a 23 year old soldier, but they came, these choices came. Um, getting to see that it's healing for other veterans, um, getting to know that she's not alone. Um, that's been a gift. I feel like some of this has been God just reminding me that I was alone when I experienced these things, but I'm not alone today. When people read things and they message me and like, Diana, I feel like I'm there with you and I can't believe this and this is painful and this is beautiful. Like I hear God's voice again say, you're not alone. And like that's this re together of the whole human body that what, what, what hurts a 23 year old in war still hurts a 40 year old mom. And when I see someone who has nothing to do with war but can enter into it and say, that looks painful, Diana then all of a sudden we're knit back together and we're, and we're put back into this belonging, even though it's hard and there's tension, and there isn't really answers. Um, to me, that is what's in my bones. That's peace where everybody is at the table and they have what they need to thrive. And that's not a one and done. That's not a solution. Um, that's us continuing to show up at the table and being honest about what we need and what's painful, and then looking at the person next to us and say, like, if they don't have what they need, then I'm going to work for that until they feel safe, until the we is all here. And so I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't want to make this all about me, but September 11th is hard, ladies. Um, and so I'm really grateful to get to be here with you, as honestly, um, and fully human and not finished um, in it. So I don't want to give away the whole book and I don't want to just <laughs> gab. <laughs> oh my word, yeah. Um, thank you for being with us on September 11. And maybe, maybe for those of you who are on the screen as well, just why don't you put in the chat, where were you on September 11 on that day when we heard the news? Because um, we're joining from different parts of the world, Diana. Um, uh, so. But I know that's a, it's a day that changed not just North America, but it changed the world. Um, I, I remember sitting in a basement parking lot when I heard the news. Yeah. So um, yeah. So just while you while you do that, I just wanted to share um, the prayer that you that you prayed that night when you were wrestling with how do you, what do you do with that command to drive over a child? I mean, it's, I mean, your first chapter, <laughs> first three chapters wrecked me already, right? Like, this is like, wow. Um, but you said, oh God, oh God, help me into the dark. And as I prayed for the tension in my chest to release, I heard something in the dark, but I love them. I love them too, Diana. And so today, as we are on September 11, we think about that and how God loves 
everybody around the world, like all of the six, was it six or seven billion? I can remember now of humanity. Oh. One of the things that I think about with 9-11, because I just graduated as a nurse and I just started as a hospice oncology nurse when I got called up to go to war, um, is that 9-11 was devastating. And I think more than anything, it took a security. Even if it was a false sense of security, people really had this sense of security that nothing would happen on our soil. And one of the um, first things you learn as a nurse is the stages of grief. <laughs> and there's denial, and then there's anger. <laughs> then there's acceptance. And I really, to this day, feel like um, America as a country got stuck in anger. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't move to acceptance. And then we didn't move to like, well, what do we do now? And so a generation of kids have been raised being fed anger. And that's what really breaks my heart. Um, I think that's a lot of what we're seeing is um, these are stages that you have to move through <laughs> um, for something good to actually grieve the whole process. Um, but if you get stuck in one, then that's all you have to offer. And it will dictate what you do, which is why two years after 9-11, we entered a war in a country that did not have any connection um, to the terrorist attacks. And one of my print of Love teammates, it's wild, um, his name is Asan. And after I left Iraq, I didn't think that I would ever get invited into another Iraqi family's home. I thought that was done. Um, and then I started working at print of Love and my teammate is Asan. And for some reason, we find each other. <laughs> And where I was stationed in Iraq was the southern half. And he, his village was just like two skips over from where I was tenting in the desert. And so really, um, he's the only person on the whole Praying to Love team, only person that I knew who we were both in the war at the same time together. Because the landscape changed every, each person experienced something totally different. But we experienced the same thing. So he knew the same checkpoints and we knew what was happening. And so um, he was 17. He was a 17 year old when I was 23 years old when we were there together. So I kept envisioning him being one of the gaggle of boys who kind of, they like they hang out on the street and like American soldiers were not, like a 17 year old Iraqi boy was not one of the little kids that they gave candy to. Mm -hmm. They saw them as threatening. And so I was always terrified that um, Assan was mistreated by, um, by my army, by the people I was with. Um, but we bonded and he's always like, Diana, you gotta come back. We'll go to this village and you can go see your people again. And it's been heartbreaking to see that now he is more worried about his daughter's future than he was five years ago. That it's been 17 years since the U.S. invaded his country and promised the people that they would do better for the people's sake. That was what we said. And now, like now more than ever, like the people feel like they don't have a future, that there isn't electricity, there isn't water. And they're like, we will die in the streets because our kids deserve a future. And they don't have one under this government of all that has been promised and all that has been done. And so I feel like I lament that on 9-11, that he, he's scared and he's lived through a lot. And there are a lot of promises made um, to him and to his country. And now he is, he says it's worse than it's ever been. And so I feel connected to that. And as peacemakers, I feel like I always say, like, you can't begin to wage peace until you can find your complicity in what is broken. And so for me, it's a direct line. But I also think it's a challenge for all of us to find where we're directly or ind indirectly benefiting um, from things that have been done on our behalf, whether we consented or not. Um, so Isan is like this beautiful link that I have, but it's also still um, that I want things better for his kids and my kids, which means we're going to have to talk about 9-11 and we're going to have to envision moving from anger to acceptance to rebuilding a new way to be together.
because veterans affected by 9-11 are still here and then Iraqis are still here and we all have memories. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not erased. Um, even if it's painful, even if we don't know how to make it better. Um, so that's kind of a little bit, I'm so happy that I know him, but it so breaks my heart. Um, but he did, I did get to go back to Iraq two years ago when there was kind of a break with ISIS and I did get to go to his home and he did invite me in and I got to hold his babies. And I thought, man, like if when there's conflict, we can, we can set it in our mind a vision that 15 years out from the conflict, we will be able to hold each other's babies. The people we've been told to see as our enemies. Like if we choose that this is what we want, then we're going to have to go about conflict differently. But I want that to be the goal. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> oh my word. Oh. Okay, so can I ask as we are, I'm gonna ask this as we reflect, okay. So if you can think of somebody you, you could maybe picture as an enemy right now, um, and what would be like to hold that person's baby? Okay. Um, I wanna ask you also about Om Hassan, cause she sounds like a dangerous woman to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel like she's is so inspiring. Um, so I don't know. I, do you want to just share a little bit? Like you, you wrote about her in such a beautiful way. Um, just here's a woman who opened a door. Here's a woman who had a welcome. So yeah, tell us about her. So <laughs> I had been in, we had only been in the country a couple weeks, maybe a month or two, and we had been tasked to go to this village and we we're going to rebuild a culvert uh, for their school. And I was a medic, so like, I was just standing around waiting for someone to get hurt and it's like 120 degrees. <laughs> and so, you know, a lot of time war is just waiting around. <laughs> Um, so anyways, we're always, we're always supposed to travel in pairs and right um, kind of when the heat would get the worst in the afternoon, like 12 to 2, um, all Iraqis would hide out and they would take naps um, because it was so awful. But the U.S. military did not. <laughs> we would just keep going. And anyways, I don't know why, but I found myself walking through the little village and there's just a little dirt road with these squat houses on either side just seven or eight houses and I remember it was so hot and I just was walking this Wednesday afternoon and all of a sudden I heard the, this metal creak and I looked and there's that kind of corrugated metal door that you oftentimes see um, and this little door creaked open and I saw just this woman's eyes but I did see the universal uh, finger wave. <laughs> and I remember in a moment, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> it's like, you know, why is she asking a, a U.S. soldier to go into the safety of her home? Like, I'm armed, I've got all my battle rattle on, and I was like, this makes no sense. And I looked around me, and I was like, I don't have anyone with me. And in a minute, I knew that no one knew where I was. So if I walked through this door and the sweet little old lady was just bait and there was the enemy behind her, I would never get hurt from again. Um, but at the same moment, there was just like fireworks in my chest. And I just felt like I heard this voice that was just like, don't miss this. So everything in my training told me to just act like I didn't see her and like protect and defend my welfare. Um, but there was just something pounded in my chest that just said, don't miss this, Diana. And so in a moment, I just decided to go off script. I was just going to do the thing that all my training said not to do. I was going to say yes. And I was going to act like I had something priceless to give instead of something to protect. And so I walked my little butt through that door. And <laughs> there's this woman in head to toe, um, black gowns because that is, um, that's kind of the privacy cloak that was traditional. And I walk through the door and all of a sudden she hugs me and brings me through the courtyard. And then all of a sudden I'm in her darkened living room 
with all her daughters and all her grandkids. And she's just sitting me down, clucking around, and the kids are coming. Um, and there was no enemy behind the door. Yeah. And she just welcomed me into her family. And I feel like there was something changed when she offered me that preemptive love, that choosing to trust me before she knew if I was trustworthy, before she knew if I would hurt her or help her. Like somehow that was the linchpin and it just changed everything that I knew about us versus them, about my faith. Um, so she brought me in and I feel like it really ignited something in me that didn't know that was dying. Like this us versus them was killing me. The suspicion. Um, so she just took me into her family and something just gave me the oxygen. And I realized that she was the very first person that I'd ever met who had really shown me what Jesus on the cross really looked like. That self-sacrificing, like, I will choose you even if it costs me my life. Um, she chose me. And I feel like that just pivoted and gave me this way to see that I hadn't seen before. Um, and so I had always thought that meeting Preemptive Love Coalition, that they were the ones who know about preemptive love. And it wasn't until I was writing this down, going back to the story, that I realized, oh, Hassan, she is the one. Um, and as often as women are unseen and not seen as the heroes because they don't found organizations, they aren't the speakers, like, she was the one who changed my life. Like, because of her, my kids have a mama that fully is alive and isn't angry and regretful and bitter. Like, she's the reason my kids get me today. Um, she brought me back from the dead, and I didn't even know I was dead. Um, so she's really the person that, and I love it that when people read, they're like, oh, Hassan, I'm like, you're right. It was her. All <laughs> along, it was her. It, it was really beautiful to see how you were writing through your struggle to be human or to regain your humanity, and that that was part of that like she was per that person who helped pull that out of you I thought that was so beautiful and I love that she is an Iraqi and she is a woman and she is a grandma like if you take the marginalized groups <laughs> like she was every single one that's a little bit dismissed um but she is the hero of my story and she's the one that I want to point people back to and say look at this because she taught me how to love and it's, and it's changed everything for me. It's beautiful. Um, I, I mean, I can talk to you for hours, <laughs> um, but I want to, I want to give uh, everybody on the screen, I want to give you a little chance. If you have a question for Diana today, like I'm going to ask her one more thing and then um, you, then if you, and then we're going to open it up if you want to ask some questions. Okay. If you have a question for her. Um, I, 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 I was really struck when you were talking to your boys, especially after your Ethiopian son had, like, had both of them had had a violent encounter and you were talking about that, you know, violence isn't just in war. Um, it's, it can be on the playground, it can be our words. And you said you have the most powerful weapon and it is love. And it was something about how you said it that made me realize how, that I, for, I for, even though we're like, she loves. <laughs> And then I, um, and we um, we truly want to walk in love, right? Like um, there was something about how you said it that unlocked something for me about love, and that how that how love is a weapon, is a, and it's the most powerful weapon, and it is um, yeah, it remains, and it's all of those things. Um, I'm I just want to hear more about how has love been unlocked for you. Um, whether it's through writing this book um, or it's just walking it out now after, you know, in the, in the, in the midst of just um, um, the world reckoning with our racism, all of those things too, right? Because you layer it, like the book is not just about Iraq. This is also just, you layer through anti-racism, you're an, you know, you're an anti-racist and an activist as well. So just how is that, how is that, how is that coming to play for you these days? I am I am always, I am always challenging myself to show up in the most loving way I can. Um, and it's truly not every day. 
I, like, if I'm being really honest, I'm like, one day out of seven, I just really can do it. <laughs> but the rest, it's a struggle. But I think the truest thing that I saw about the power of love was that in the middle of a place where there are bullets and there are bombs, and every day when I woke up, I heard the names of those who had been killed the day before. Um, the biggest thing that I saw was that was the power of love. Everybody had guns. Everybody could scare somebody by saying you're going to kill them. Like this seemed like the most like in some odd way, it seemed like toddler games. But the power of love made me lay down my weapon. The power of love, the way she invited me in and chose me and trusted me first, like that made me have the ability to question my faith, um, the way my faith had told me that you had to take a life to serve your country and you ultimately had to take a life to serve God. Um, it allowed me to belong to something so much bigger. And so I think when I first walked into war, I thought, you know, it's the tanks and it's the guns and it's the fear of death. That's the strongest, scariest thing that I know. But once I ran into Om Hassan, I realized that the most powerful weapon on the planet has always been love. Like it's always been love. If we look at the self-sacrificing love of Jesus on the cross, if we look at Gandhi, if we look at Martin Luther King, like these were all acts of love. And we talk about them today and you can't buy them at a store and you can't, um, you know, they say in current, like COVID people, Americans have bought out all the guns and all the bullets. <laughs> but you, you, like you cannot shield yourself from somebody who puts you first. Like you cannot protect yourself from someone who self-sacrificially loves you or your children. Like we cannot. And that's, that's the wooing of the divine. Um, and so I think that, that has set me on a course that I find it harder to love. Um, but I also know that it's the, it's the most powerful way to do it, even if it costs me. I remember that part you're talking about, um, Idolette, where I was telling my sons that the most powerful weapon I know I'm arming them with to go out into an angry and violent world is still love. They may not get ahead, but I know the only way to build something new and something true and genuine is with love. And so it kind of just makes things a little simpler for me. I don't have so many options because I know they just don't work. Fear doesn't work. <laughs> Um, violence doesn't work. Uh, I feel like we've all tried it. Our history has tried everything there is, um, but they really haven't tried a love that jumps first. And, um, and I think I'm not going to say it right, but there is this phrase in South Korea when they were trying to do some diplomacy with Nor North Korea, and it was called the sunshine policy. And so the whole idea was, well, how do you get a guy to take off his coat? And the one guy was like, well, you just got to like blow the wind until it just, he, you know, rips him off. And then the guy, he just had the sun come out until the, the man got so hot, he voluntarily took off his jacket. And so South Korea was calling it the sunshine policy where they were going to do good to North Korea to warm them. They were going to do so much good that they would just have to, um, to participate in, in relationship. And so I don't know how to do it. I just know that if it works in war, then it's got to work here in my family, in my community, and with my neighbors. And that's just what I'm going to do, even if it's painful, even if I don't really know how to do it all the time, and I don't even want to do it half the time. Um, but that is what I'm going to give my kids, and that is what I'm going to show up with. Thank you so much.